Okay. Hello everyone, welcome to tonight's episode. The title is Your Ability is Waiting for You, or you could see the title as Your Abilities are Waiting for You. Now, what does that mean? Why would someone use the idea of ability as if ability is waiting for you? Usually people are waiting for themselves to become able in different endeavors in this life. But could an ability, could a potential be waiting for you? The earlier we go back in history, we notice meaning being less structured. Right now, currently in 2020, we as creatures tell ourselves a story of our life. We live in this story and based on the uh, how much the inner realm story and the outer realm story, they deviate from, from one another, suggests the reality. But there was a time where how would I say it? Either the external defines man or the internal defines external. Before language, what could people really say? <laughs> I'm just getting this sense that when we look at it in the past, there was less structure, less filters of interpretation or giving value to things. So abilities would uh, more naturally arise. You know, maybe the person held the stick, suddenly, uh, you know, the stick fell from his hand and the person suddenly realized he can throw the stick, you know. And what was a stick back in the day, let's say, used for defensive purposes, now began becoming used for offensive purposes. Or we can say the person only used the stick to walk and then suddenly realized they could fight with it suddenly they noticed there was the possibility of a different engagement with the moment that would open a different ability. Many people don't realize this. Uh, in life, if you are someone who can easily change, you will see various uh, ways of your own being. Think of it this way. Think of it right now. You are a creature with <coughs> uh, endless abilities. Endless, let's say. As edges, the, the, the end of the list goes as far as the edge of the sky. Or let's say, for example, let me make bring this more down to earth. Let's say you are uh, a talented piano player, a talented violinist, um, a talented um, Japanese ceramic maker. <laughs> Whatever. The, the whole point of it is that there is potential if the reality doesn't engage a way where that potential can, can come on the surface the ability is as if non-existent <clears throat> what does that mean that means imagine in this life uh, 
I mean, I don't want to pat, pat myself on the back, but there was a point where I never thought I'd be going towards literature. I'd be going towards trying to see what the mind of man is willing to do. In my youth, like, I wanted to be a soccer player. <laughs> I, I wanted to. <laughs> it wasn't anything internal related. It was like, I just want to kick a ball into a goal, you know? And uh, <laughs> later on, that changed, built an advanced civilization while you're breathing. That, is, that, 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 is, that was the change. And when that changed, when I realized it is not just the bodies of man that are here, it is also the mind of humanity that is here. Then, my own beliefs had to break in front of my eyes. I had to break my eyes free from my beliefs. And what I mean by that is nothing breaks. Like if you're a person who has a certain view on something, only something experiential and at the resonance of your childhood where you were at a comfortable emotion where you accepted the idea. There is this uh, <clears throat> uh, philosopher named Soren Kierkegaard. And Kierkegaard talks about morality in such a unique way where he says it's as if we don't, we can't tell if the creature uh, can know if it's good or bad. It's like some philosophers were like, how do we know? How do we know what is good and bad? <laughs> and of course, it's, it's, it's based on <clears throat> what we see, the, um, the result of it, the echo of an action into the future. But, but I'm saying... Uh, man is in a very strange position. For me, this is going to sound strange, guys. Usually, most people are under the impression you got to know something and then you become able. Not true. Not true. Sometimes, if you want to see how able you are, you have to step into the unknown. You know? Can you imagine, for example, Christopher Columbus was, um, even though this man is known to have found, you know, the new world and whatnot, but and and he was also a bit savage, and you can totally see this guy was on the boat for so many days that when he got off the boat, he wasn't in a proper state of mind. Uh, <clears throat> imagine Columbus as a little kid. I'm not saying this is true. I'm just this is Mr. Within's playful animation of this view, <clears throat> and. Uh, so imagine I, uh, uh, um, Columbus, Christopher Columbus, uh, as a little kid. And imagine he doesn't have a father. And imagine he's just with his mother. Okay? So Christopher Columbus is looking out the window and he's like, I want to go outside, Mom. <laughs> and Christopher Columbus' mother is like, no, son, you're not allowed to leave the house. You know? You're not allowed to leave the house. It's too dangerous. You know? I don't know if your father died in a war or something. You can't, you know? And so imagine Christopher Columbus, this kid, every day looking out the window of his house but not being able to leave. And then he suddenly shouts, imagine, he's like, I want to see what's out there. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is, Human beings, their ability is based on their awareness. Their awareness is based on how far they've endured into the unknown with the torch of their consciousness of their hand. Most people, believe it or not, they fear metaphysics. They fear the unknown. They fear an imagery that can surpass the status quo's acceptance of what normal normality is. But the thing is... There is a Freudian issue. You see, the child is born, and unlike other animal species, it's weird. Like when you see a deer, or an elk, or caribou, or something, when you see these animals, when the young is born, when the child is born, the child knows how to run. It's like, what the... F it's like, when, did the when did the deer... The genetical memory is accessible but when a human being 
When a human being lives the child, you got to teach it how to walk, you got to teach it how to speak, you got to teach it da 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 you know? Animals don't have a, a, as much of a genetical amnesia as I feel the human being does. I really feel that there is code in this world. There is a geometrical code underneath the surface of all visible phenomena. This may, this may sound a bit bold, guys, but <clears throat> throughout my life, I've had various moments where I've attempted my own ultimate option. What does that mean? That means, imagine you're in, in a moment and there is a known, the known variables are what your past gives you. So the known variables to the moment, oh, okay, this is similar to that, this is similar to that. Like when I come to speak about a topic, uh, I, f I see the similarities to the past. But when you want to see something new, if you were, if you are to see a new dimension to yourself, how can you be the same self? So it's as if this sense of the ability of the person as their view of self changes, their ability in the, in the world they see themselves in changes. So think of the idea of yourself uh, being this idea of yourself because you have separated from stuff. You're saying, this is the world, I'm on it. We don't right now feel we are the earth. We feel we are on earth. Do you see the difference? There was a point in evolution where we weren't even conscious enough to even know we're on earth or we are earth. There was an inseparability. Then there came this separation. This is a huge evolutionary point. That's what I call the subjective evolution where nobody's talking about. They didn't teach and they don't teach it to people. It's as if they will teach you uh, uh, about all the stuff that's here, but not what's moving it. And what's moving it isn't poetry, isn't just philosophy, and it isn't some uh, um, uh, hidden man in the sky whose beards are whose beards are made of clouds. It is not a story. <clears throat> okay, so guys, my attention has come to the chat section. Uh, Kimberly, welcome to the chat. It's kind of cool. It's like you got to find the world. You got to find, uh, here's the thing. Imagine you, you right now as a person, let's say you want to do something. Let's say you want to, um, let's say you want to become, uh, an incredible violinist, just as an example. I'm not a violinist. <laughs> but I'm saying, let's say if you wanted to. <clears throat> or let me say something that, uh, whatever you want to do, if you can't see it be done behind your eyes, who can do it in front of your eyes? I feel that the world is able. 
I feel that many abilities that human beings seek, it is how you have kept the idea of the human that suggests what you're able to do. If you feel you are weak, you will be of the weak. If you feel strong, you will be of the strong. The issue is that the child feels growing into this world that it doesn't have choice. And that's the difficulty of working with your mind on this planet. It's not just uh, sitting, I, I would I want to say it's just simple sitting meditation. <clears throat> Re reality is the more you engage it, the levels open up. In my youth, I would get into fights, physical fights. At, oftentimes I would feel I don't have the ability and it wasn't that I would get into the fight I have a twin brother and um, there were some years that we were in uh, Iran uh, where I was born and I could tell you that anytime my brother my twin brother was in a fight as if everybody knew they were fighting two people that means it didn't matter if, 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 if my twin brother was fighting um, someone, uh, you know, at the time five years older than us uh, or whatever. Whatever the situation was, the identity, the identity that, uh, you know, there is some, a situation going on where it's as if you could have been in there, what would your own brother do? Do you know? So there's been many situations where when my brother was in a fight instantly, it was as if my, it was as if, you know what it is? Um, <laughs> they should have this saying, they should say, don't fight a twin, you're fighting two people. <laughs> I remember, I remember in, uh, <clears throat> you know, nowadays the world is, is, is allowing itself to get bullied. I will tell you this very seriously, that from an Eastern perspective and from a Western perspective, the, the liberation, you know how there's this saying that they say too much freedom leads to chaos? Too much freedom. If you give someone too much freedom, if you, it gives extreme freedom to a young child, that child doesn't know enough about the world to handle that freedom. So if you sometimes giving too much freedom to someone is like a weight they can't carry, you know, because the mind has to go through certain experiences to be able to pilot itself. Most people don't realize. Most people are being raised under the wings of other systems, other patterns. <coughs> so <laughs> in that situation, the identity evoked the responsibility that instantaneously considered the ability. That's what I'm saying. And I really feel the secret, the, the way that there, there's no such thing as bad karma and good karma. There are those who want to take and there are those who want to give by nature, by nature. If, if you want to give, now usually in life people feel life is having a toll on them, is taking something from them. You know, throughout the years of my life personally on this planet, as it, I, I feel like it's not just me taking from the planet. The planet every day is taking something from me. Do you know? It is taking the quality of my energy. That means it's like I've, I, every, every human being can notice that when you enter this life, it's not like you're just an image and you remain that image till the end of your life. You're like, okay, I was, I'm this self now, so I'm going to be this all the time. It, 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 that's not the case. Sometimes to wonder... Uh, about your ability means to get to first see the fool of that new self. For me, I don't think it's it's we are going from one self to suddenly upgrade to better self, better self, better self. I think that's nonsense. 
You know, I don't think it's this constant like, yeah, man, improve till the end of time. You know, self help ad infinitum. <laughs> For me, it's like you got to become the fool of the new world that you want to enter. That means there's going to be in anything. If you right now want to go be a basketball player and you don't have any experiences playing basketball, and you don't know what's going to happen. But if you go towards it, you will be the fool. The first couple of basketball games you play, you're like, oh my God, what, what, it's like, what am I doing here? You know, but then if you endure, I am telling you, um, they say three times the charm, Mr. Within would say, if you make it 30 times the charm, everything happens. If you endure, it's two things. This is life, guys. Either you stand your ground and the environment changes, or the environment stands its ground and you change. This is in, in regards to character, because we're creatures of attention. Right now, as I'm speaking, these sounds, these words, they direct attention. But the ultimate thing is realizing the nature of that attention. And this might sound strange. I'm a person here giving a talk on ability, but the origin of that ability has nothing to do with whether seeing there is a self or a world, or there is truth or that truth. It's life sensitivity. On the, in this plane of existence, those who are life sensitive, they pilot well. Those who want the future, who are treating the future like their own past, oof. I'm telling you, you dishonor the future, the, the tragedy of it is that it forgets you. Any system right now which is having a negative influence on uh, the future generations, well, it, it's like, it, let me tell you, you can't, you throw a stick at a lion once, and those people who try to prevent the future, the future potential of the species, it's uh, the future roars back. The future roars back. I can't tell you just like how you see in movies they the like in, in in those like war movies back in the day not like like medieval times or whatever like when the warrior would die they would just move their fingers upon the guy's face and close the eyes of the warrior as if like a chapter of existential activity has come to a completion there are certain days where I look at this life and I'm like, who the hell am I? <laughs> it's like this giant natural system with so many cause and effect probabilistic factors happening simultaneously that at some point all that I have ever been able to, to do uh, on this planet is to just bow at the great performance occurring. And to realize your own moment as an in immediate conscious event is a privilege. You know, it's, it's as if very few people realize what an achievement it is to be. It is an achievement that has surpassed all those who don't exist yet. It is an achievement that surpasses all those who have existed and are gone. That we right now, in this moment, in this live stream, are viewing upon existence. The grand show, the grand happening. There is a quote from Terence McKenna that ever since I heard him say this, it, it made me... Uh, feel like there's crowds of people in the world that still care for uh, nature's mind before man. 
<coughs> Let me just find the quote for you. Terence McKenna, this um, scholar and I would say social scientist, he says, reclaim your mind and get it out of the hands of the cultural engineers who want to turn you into a half-baked moron consuming all this trash that's being manufactured out of the bones of a dying world. When he says, in the hands of the cultural engineers, you know what who the cultural engineer is? All of us. Nature. And it's not just urban society, you know, and the image that's being sold there. You see, Terence McKenna is saying there is an exchange of unfair levels happening where the human being is engaging in an experience of a civilization, yet missing out on the nature of it. You know, there was, there was something very intense I noticed. For a time, I was thinking that could religion have been, uh, of course, it was the experience of a revelation, but could the mind be accumulating patterns and imagine a cup. Imagine you have a cup and you fill that cup up to the brim and it reaches the brim and then it overflows and there's a surplus. So I was thinking, what if the human being is a container and when the human being has acknowledged the objective realm, their objective world, their manifestation to a certain degree, then the only thing that seems, uh, let me tell you, it's, it's like there's one level before uh, all the idea of the spiritual. And it's the subjective. It's as if, uh, it's like there's your, okay, here, it's like there's reality, <coughs> um, Okay, here, let's say you're, you're, we go with the traditional model of body, mind, soul. Soul being 100% unknown, body being 100% known, mind being 50% known, 50% unknown. You know, the mind's relaxed, guys. The mind's between worlds. <laughs>
I remember when I was young, I would hear this thing. They would say, um, don't play with fire. <clears throat> but I'll say this for many people who don't know this about Iranian culture. There's a day they call it Charsham Suri, where pretty much they, it, you know, they throw fireworks on the street. <laughs> like, I don't know how to tell you. Like, you can YouTube this and see this, but like, <laughs> uh, and it, it's a day where they jump over a fire, you know? So in Persian culture, it's one of those cultures where the people jump over a fire. You know, we make a fire and the whole family comes and they p playfully jump and it's like this exciting event. Of course, a safe fire and whatnot. <clears throat> and so, even though there was that, and this idea like don't play with fire and whatnot, The universe can be seen as a division between strong and weak nuclear forces. That means it's like little did I know, fire is playing with our eyes. What I meant by what I mean by that is light. It's fascinating how much of existence is, is visual. And it's fascinating that the visuals are in three-dimensional space. And it's fascinating that as we move in this three-dimensional space, imagine if you left and came to the same spot, the only thing separating that three-dimensional uh, point from the two different times you were in the same spot is time. Time is the additional dimension. And when we see, wait a minute, so we were in three dimensions and we created this additional dimension of time. So you're telling me what's keeping us from creating the, creating the other dimensions? You see? So for me, dimension, uh, the, the higher dimension would be a definition of witnessing the complete dimension here, the dualistic uh, game that's going on. There's a dualistic pattern to this life, by the way. I mean, everybody knows this. Your morality, when you think somebody is good, somebody's bad, when you like someone, dislike someone, you know? When you think something is correct, when you think something is wrong, these, this, this is your duality. This is like the planet has a tilt, has an axis, and you as a human being has a, have a moral axis. <clears throat> and that moral axis could be based on what you have seen others. Because you see, I noticed something fascinating, guys. I ex when I look at myself in the mirror, imagine there was someone, like, I'm, I'm, how would I say it? Imagine someone standing beside you and imagine you um, uh, looking at your reflection in the mirror. I notice that the reflection, me seeing, looking through the mirror and seeing a third person view of myself is equivalent in selfhood, experience of selfhood is me seeing another. So I feel that really at our pure core, we're energy conscious of itself, experientially able to, to observe, but before language. So what I mean by that is, we are the here and now, then we are in the here and now as poetically as I can say. For me, ability has to come from vision. That means even before, right? It, like if, if you close your eyes, you don't have access to the spectrum and the options of the landscape. So the most immediate thing one can say about ability is that you need eyes. You need new eyes to be able. That means if you look at something and you're like, oh, this is, this is impossible. <laughs> that means with those eyes, yes, they will remain impossible till the end of time. Unless you look differently. 
at the world that you thought you knew only to see experientially you are the knower of it. That means, who do you think is, uh, even if there was a will, Alan Watts speaks about a veil, mystical traditions speak about uh, a veil, uh, a sort of interdimensional curtain, and this curtain, who do you think is on the other side? And this is uh, probably only once ever I'm going to ask this on, on the live stream for people listening. You can give an answer. Who do you think is on the other side of the veil? And I'll give you <clears throat> a kind of hint. Is it an object? Is it a subject? Or is it all of the above and beyond? Sometimes uh, there was a time where I felt the reason religious ideology, religion, as you see, spirituality is kind of hilarious. Spirituality is like the new, even though it's like, you know what it is? <clears throat> spirituality is like, uh, <laughs> how do I say? I mean, the experience of the multidimensionality of reality was there way before the language. The language reflects the inner events. That means we, we acknowledge an outer history, but we don't wonder about the history of the eyes of the person behind before they see the world. Or not before they see the world, before they become conscious of the world. Let's say that, I mean, of course, the child is born physically, but the child isn't born as a person. The child is born as a presence, as a biological presence, which has to be taken care of and loved by the world and the family. <clears throat> now, that presence, they say, after, at a certain point that the parents and talk to it, you know, they do the peekaboo or whatever. And uh, by the way, something I got to tell people, if you see a young kid, don't do that peekaboo thing. Um, there's something that that leaves off a psychological pattern for the child, the peekaboo thing, when the child is super young and you do it. You know what's, what's fascinating? It's like when we are younger, um, oh, what was it? Somebody, some, sorry guys, I'm having too many thoughts intersect. <laughs> Something I do sometimes is that I stare at my palm. And when I stare at my palm, it's not that I'm looking at my palm and seeing lines or anything. I just look at my palm and I wonder about what have I really held on to in this life. And it may be strange. In, in, in the outer realms, many different things. I'm trying to run many projects. But in the inner realms... There is this strange waiting to see what happens to emptiness.
sorry guys, uh, just taking a quick breather. Your ability is how much you have cared to look at this world and you have cared to wonder about who's looking. It comes down to that. And there's so many instructions people in this world can give. You want an instruction. You want uh, something out from outside of your mind. Do you know endless phenomena can be interpreted endlessly by you? The mind is strangely like these video game engines, these um, video game developers use, where wherever the character goes, a world gets built. And wherever I go, it's like my inner realms are owning the moment. The ability of the human being, again, goes back to how the attention arises in the moment. We know the attention doesn't begin as an individual. So we can say birth is a non-individual phenomena. And the interesting thing is that there's a huge chance death is also a non-individual phenomena. And we see that the shamanic cultures would say, there were, uh, certain shamanic cultures, they would put the youngest person in the family with the oldest person, uh, uh, oldest family member. The youngest kid would be with like the oldest grandmother. And they would say, why? And the shamanic culture would say, because one is about to enter the spirit world and one has just stepped out of it. One is about to step into the spirit realm. One has stepped out of it. So, in other words, the spirit realm is the non-individual, is, is the presence. I feel right now we're on one side of the coin of energy, we're appearing as manifest visible creatures. On the other side of the coin, I feel we are being the space. We, we are uh, like uh, an immaterial phenomena simulating matter. I'm not joking. When it goes to if, if there is anything, con any continuity beyond the physical form, because the most interesting thing, all these people speaking about spirituality, because there are people uh, uh, through, in some sense uh, trying to find responses to the theatrics of existence. On some level, I realize what are the options? If the person uh, can't do nothing or does nothing, the result is nothing. As Wayne Gretzky says, you miss 100% uh, of the shots you don't take. <clears throat> but if there is something that is beyond the individual 
and is able, then it means whatever idea have you have on your ability or what you think your ability is, is irrelevant to the actual ability. That means it's very hard for me to write now, even as I'm giving this talk, it's very, it's not that it's difficult, but it's, it's this kind of challenge of me wondering, uh, who is speaking, uh, who, like, uh, who am I? Is it simultaneous? Is it, is it, for example, um, uh, the, uh, what do you, what do you call it? What's the term for it? Is it my social identity that is, that is inspiring this talk? Or, Am I simultaneously being the world? Is Mr. Within speaking to you or is nature speaking to you? Do you see that the inseparability of being simultaneously on an existential level with going through a sort of dualistic experience? I would say experience is uh, spiraling, existence is flat out just there. I, um, when I say existence, I mean uh, uh, the conscious view. Sometimes if you don't open the door, you'll never see what's behind. And sometimes you can't chase the butterfly. If the ability has to come from your inner realms, it is most likely an activity of observance. The inner realms are not like the outer realms. In the outer realms, you can uh, touch an object, lift it into the air, put it down on the table. But in your inner realms, the, if you were to say, if, if there, in the inner realm something was moving, it's not your hand. It's not like you have a body behind your eyes. It's not like the soul is some like Casper movie ghost thing. Do you know? The warrior has to honor the weapon and has to understand the why the weapon is in the hand of the warrior. And so you could tell that the warriors that knew why they were fighting were at a different class than the warriors that were just fighting. <clears throat> and so there is a difference between an efficient strategy and an inefficient strategy that you see their outcomes. Efficiency is not about just uh, what hand you were dealt and, oh, okay, this is, you're efficient because you got the thing. It's about the, it, it, how far the mind is willing to fragment to view. Your mind is so able where it's like, uh, I don't know how to say it, the mind can suddenly unify into one common mirror. You can stand in this reality and observe all phenomena as one occurrence. All reality, everything that has ever happened. Before thought, it is one occurrence. You can see the presence of your universe. 
But then you can see the present, the, the dualism of the personality in this universe. And that is its own ability. So I would say four general types of ability I would say there is on this planet. An ability to look into the void, an ability to be the singular, an ability to move the dual, and an ability to be the infinite. And right now on this planet, like it's kind of like if you were to see it as a brain where different parts of the brain are doing something, it was as if the Zen masters and the Buddhists went and dived into the relationships of uh, a conscious phenomena with the void. And you see all the, all the people in regards to the religious, monotheistic religions, they went with the relationship of consciousness with the singular. And you see in, in the modernity where we have the, all the endless stories of reality of good and bad, all the good and bad stories you've ever seen in films and anything you've seen. You know, that's the dualistic. That's an ability to be able to look at something and see it in two dimensions. Your mind... is the greatest gift that awaits to be opened. But your mind is not an object. And if you're even wise, it's neither a subject. So what is it? It is the process of the inseparability of your attention with phenomena. I'll give you an example of how I, for example, I mean, even though it's, it's just from my inner realms, but I felt my inner realms uh, instructed me, uh, not instructed me, my inner realms, you see, some people sometimes see language. Uh, I am very comfortable perceiving inner events, internal events. That means I could be speaking to you right now, and it would be as if, like, uh, even though I'm in a room, just just speaking to, like, uh, you know, on my headphones, uh, but it, behind my eyes, I can see, multi I can, my attention can exist to itself in multiple ways. So there is a behind the scenes to even uh, all these talks that I'm giving, but the behind the scenes is... I will tell you the greatest clue that Leonardo da Vinci gave about this is that simplicity is the most ultimate sophistication. Anyone who understands that, um, you instantly become an advanced communicator. So, um, dear listeners, I'm going to go into a quote tunnel that I felt I should go. And I'm going to, a quote tunnel is a segment of these shows where I just read a bunch of quotes uh, from either a notable person in history so the audience and just myself can also see the inner realms of that person. <clears throat> or a certain theme. Now... For this episode, I was thinking of the theme ability, but I feel like I'm going to instead share with you um, certain quotes from this Lebanese um, poet, incredible poet, one of the greatest poets this planet knows. And his name is Khalil Gibran. And I'm going to just read some quotes from him and uh, so we can get a sense of how this man's inner realms uh, saw the outer.
Khalil Gibran says, Your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They came through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. Khalil Gibran says, I prefer to be a dreamer among the humblest, with visions to be realized, than Lord amongst those without dreams and desires. Khalil Gibran says, life without love is like a tree without blossoms or fruit. Khalil Gibran is pretty much saying, nobody likes a fruitless tree, guys. Don't be a fruitless tree in society. Don't you dare. <laughs> Khalil Gibran says we choose our joys and sorrows long before we experience them. Wow. Khalil Gibran says, I love you when you bow in your mosque, kneel in your temple, pray in your church, for you and I are sons of one religion, and it is the spirit. Khalil Gibran says, faith is an oasis in the heart, which will never be reached by thinking the caravan of thinking. Oh, sorry, which will never be reached by the caravan of thinking. Faith is an oasis in the heart which will never be reached by the caravan of thinking. Khalil Gibran says, Your living is determined not so much by what life brings to you as by the attitude you bring to life. Not so much by what happens to you as by the way your mind looks at what happens. Khalil Gibran says, Poverty is a veil that obscures the face of greatness, and appeal is a mask covering the face of tribulation. Khalil Gibran says, if you love somebody, let them go. For if they return, they were always yours. And if they don't, they never were. What an incredible quote. <coughs> this is gonna like, we need someone like Esther Perel sharing this quote with the world, you know? Khalil Gibran says, for life and death are one, even as the river and the sea are one. Khalil Gibran says, if my survival caused another to perish, then death would be sweeter and more beloved. Khalil Gibran says, love one another, but make not a bond of love. Let it rather be a moving sea between the shores of your souls. Khalil Gibran says, but let there be spaces in your togetherness and let the winds of the heavens dance between you. Love one another, but make not a bond of love. Let it rather be a moving sea between the sh shores of yourself. Okay, this is just like, <laughs> the quote beside it was like a more full version of the last quote. Khalil Gibran says, when love beckons to you, follow him. Though his ways are hard and steep, 
and when his wings enfold you, yield to him, though the sword hidden among his pinions may wound you. Oh, okay, this is, I think I know what imagery. Though the sword hidden among his pinions may wound you. Wow. You know what Khalil Gibran is saying in that quote? So he was a mystic. And from, from a mystical angle, when he says, when love beckons to you, it's as if an incident. It's as if he's giving words to an incident. An incident where, as if the unknown, you can do nothing with the unknown other than trust to see what happens or distrust it and not see what there is. You know, <clears throat> but also your intention and again the attitude you bring to life, as Khalil Gibran says, is important. Here he says, when love beckons to you, follow him. When in, when when it's like synchronicity. It's like he's saying, trust your synchronous Jungian synchronicity, even though it may not make sense. And then he says, and when his wings enfold you, as if imagine suddenly. I don't know if he's imagining this, but imagine an angel appeared. I think he's envisioning archangel some archangel figure, because he says, though the sword hidden among his pinions may wound you. The concept of the sword is honestly like the new. <clears throat> the shield is like the past. So I would say it, it, it's as if like when you get that calling from your intuitive love for the world or whatever, <laughs> Go through it because there is a transformation at the end, which he says, though the sword hidden among his pinions may wound you. That means your veil. You see, it's not like man just trying to uh, uh, see beyond the veil of thought. That which is beyond the veil of thought is also trying to see man. <laughs> Khalil Gibran says, the obvious is that which is never seen until someone expresses it simply. Khalil Gibran says, when we turn to one another for counsel, we reduce the number of our enemies. Wow. <clears throat> Khalil Gibran says, zeal is a volcano, the peak of which the grass of indecisiveness does not grow. Oh, to be zealous, yeah. You act like a robot in this life, you die like a robot in this life. <laughs> <laughs> Khalil Gibran says, a little knowledge that acts is worth infinitely more than much knowledge that is idle. Khalil Gibran says, work is love made visible. And if you cannot work with love, but only with distaste, it is better that you should leave your work and sit at the gate of the temple and take alms of those who work with joy. And that's an interesting idea. People think it's just them working with like a core, like just a social dimension in regards to various corporations and the way... Uh, employment is spread out in the economical, economical sector but I'm saying like it, it's like this kind of mystical view that you're not just your work is not just I don't want to say just physical but I want to say like we are conditioned to think there is only an outer life but that outer life will forever be remain as a mystery. That means if we are a three-dimensional being, but we believe there is nothing more than two dimensions, then we will never uh, realize we're three-dimensional. Or we may realize it and act like as if we haven't realized it. Which I feel the latter is what's happening actually here. So there's different ways you can work. Me personally, like these talks are, there's two motivations. I mean, there's an outer motivation, which was kind of like from the day one I knew, I said 10,000 talks for the betterment of mankind. I'm like, all right, let's give this a try. <laughs> <clears throat> but in regards to the inner realms, 
It was just to see. Sometimes, you know, even if you can't make the smartest decision, you want to at least see what the smartest decision was. You know, you want to see what the uh, clearest uh, uh, glimpse of this planet held. And Mr. Within is telling you it's alive. I am totally before, uh, you know, teaching kids in schools that civilization is built on a giant turtle's back. <laughs> because the planet is, is it, this world is alive in ways that language is, uh, is always behind. All that spirits desire, spirits attain. In this quote, he's suggesting a desire arising from a dual state for, or from a non-dual state. <clears throat> Playfulness usually is, is healthy. I, I would say when a human being feels playful, they trust the world enough to attempt... Uh, the new. Albert Einstein had said this thing that what a genius is, is connecting worlds that before never could be seen in the same light. That means Albert Einstein saw that it, it's as if we're not just uh, bridge builders outside in our outer realms, we're bridge builders in our inner realms. And it's all about these bridges and at the same time how complex you choose to see the phenomena. That means the more complex we see the human body, the more mysterious it becomes. The more you zoom in, imagine that you're looking from behind a camera uh, and that camera before you put your eyes to see what uh, what's through it, it, had, it was zoomed in on let, let's say like Mona Lisa's chin. So you couldn't even see if it was a picture of Mona Lisa. You just saw like this. You, it was so zoomed in, you just saw the color, imagine. So only if you zoom, if you zoomed out, you would see the value of the painting. And I think if we as human beings, in every moment we go, if we can zoom in and out at a certain level, we will get access to the clear vision of the moment. And that zoom, zooming in and out, I was like, oh my God, how do, I, how do I tell this to people? And I thought of talking about the idea of the pilots of consciousness. I'm tired of just being yogis in caves or being scholars on, uh, in ivory towers. You know, I realized the world needs pilots. That's what the world needs. The pilot is the, is the, is the most divine archetype for me. That means I consider my whole life not me being per se a name or an idea. I just feel I have been an attention that has piloted this far. And I, you know, it's very hard to uh, judge attention when it's not an object or subject because the object and subject are in your attention and they come and go. So just the fact that the outer environment changes quicker than you, you feel you're changing the outer environment. Sorry, sorry, you, you feel, I'm trying to say this idea that there's, uh, if you are moving faster than your world, that's what free will is. If you're moving slower than nature, how could there be free will? Nature's moving you. You see, so in one angle, nature is moving you. In one angle, uh, you are moving nature. Right now, me giving this talk as a conscious activity is me, I consider it's me consciously moving nature. That means it's like, there, there are access to inner landscapes, uh, uh, and I think it's fair to say everybody has hidden programs in their mind. And when I say hidden programs, that means it all depends, because what is desire? If when people look at desire, it's in your inner realms, you're already in the future. I got shocked. I, I sat down one night, you know, and I remember just on my bed, I, I, I sat and I closed my eyes. And I, I decided to keep my eyes closed until I could see a certain world. How can I tell you? It's like, 
Imagine somebody says, can you see yourself doing a backflip? And you are like, no, man, I've never done a backflip. I can't see myself doing a backflip. But if you sat down and closed your eyes and didn't open them until in your inner realms, you could comfortably see yourself backflipping a couple times. And then being comfortable with the inner realms, then opening your eyes, you become an incredibly... You, you are way more, your will is way more oriented in the action. <clears throat> Khalil Gibran says, Art is a step from what is obvious and well known toward what is arcane and concealed. Khalil Gibran says, Pain and foolishness lead to great bliss and complete knowledge, for eternal wisdom created nothing under the sun in vain. Wow, wow, wow. Guys, this quote from Khalil Gibran is so excellent. <clears throat> he says, They consider me to have sharp and penetrating vision because I see them through the mesh of a sieve. That quote deserves to be in a museum of the greatest sentences ever written. You know, Khalil Gibran feels to me, even though this is not the case, he feels like Rumi's cousin. <laughs> Alright guys, I'm going to read, let's say, a few more. Khalil Gibran says, The eye of a human being is a microscope, which makes the world seem bigger than it really is. Khalil Gibran says, you are the bows, oh sorry, what am I saying, you are the bows, <laughs> you are the bows from which your children as living arrows are sent forth. Technically, Khalil Gibran is calling the planet an archer, is calling nature an archer. You know, guys, there's um, this story about Diogenes, which is worth sharing. And I want you, well, while I'm telling this story, just keep in mind of the difference of what world... Um, the story is about Diogenes and Alexander the Great. And uh, I want you to look at the inner realms of these people in the story. So the story is Diogenes is just lying on the grass, chilling, you know, suddenly he sees a shadow. He opens his eyes and he's also heard footsteps and stuff. So, you know, somebody important is walking around and he suddenly there is a sh shadow. He opens his eyes and he sees Alexander the Great is blocking the sun. At the same time, the sun is appearing like a halo beyond Alexander the Great's head. And Alexander the Great has come to see Diogenes, this great philosopher who also lived like a savage. 
beast, but still. <laughs> we ignore that part for the story. You know? <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> So Alexander the Great comes to Diogenes, this great philosopher, and says, what does the great Diogenes want from the great Alexander? And all his whole entourage is like, yeah, that's what's up. <laughs> <laughs> Alexander's army's there watching, you know, like his crew. And Diogenes is there and everybody's watching. It's like, oh my God, what's this, uh, you know, old philosopher we're going to say to this great conqueror, you know? And, uh... Diogenes looks at Alexander the Great, who's telling him what he wants, and Diogenes says, Don't block my son, you piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm not making this too, too extreme. Diogenes says, Don't block my son. And for a second, Alexander the Great is uh, wise enough to understand what he's saying. So Diogenes says, Don't block my son, and he pauses. And Alexander the Great's like, don't block my son. That means don't, don't act like God in front of me. Do you know? That's kind of what, like, I, the depth of, I feel, what Diogenes was saying. Don't, don't block my son. Don't impinge on the freedom, on my freedom as a being, you know? Something of that depth, but the exact quote was, don't block my son. That was definitely said. <laughs> and so Alexander the Great looks at this and suddenly uh, when Diogenes says, don't block my son, Alexander the Great's entourage is like, oh shit, oh no, oh my God, what's going to happen? You know? And what happens is Alexander the Great suddenly he realizes the depth. He's like, holy shit, you know, that we're not just here to conquer uh, just just be a per, per, uh, strong uh, performer on stage. It's like there's there's nature here we got to be aware, attentive, aware of. And, and so so Alexander Gray turns around to his crew and he says, "If I was not the, if I was not Alexander the Great, I would be the Great Diogenes." And in that moment, suddenly Diogenes, like as if like Cobra style, like Cobra inner martial art type. <laughs> You know, uh, <laughs> Diogenes says instantly, he says, uh, if I was not Diogenes, uh, I would be Diogenes. Something, uh, I think that was exactly, if I was not uh, Diogenes, I would be Diogenes, exactly. And Alexander Great just like, okay, I'm, I'm going to stop talking right now. <laughs> And that's the story, you know? <laughs> that's the story of, uh, you know, this bewildered philosopher who scolded a conqueror towards wisdom. <laughs> Can you imagine after that, Alexander the Great, like, you know, it, like, Dogmies properly stood up and, like, saluted Alexander the Great, and Alexander the Great left, and after that, Dogmies was like, holy shit, that was close, that was close. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's interesting is I could fathom many types of planets like Earth all over the universe and I could see that if they are individual species like uh, the philosophical vision is the highest point it is the the one who's truly looking at the question. You know what it is? It's like spirit. It's like uh, here's the thing. Philosophy it has an advantage. I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind. Like here's the thing. Uh, mysticism, we can say let's say pure materialism, and uh, sci uh, let us say the scientific method and approach to be pure materialism. Okay. So we have one, 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 one side of the spectrum, pure materialism, one side of the spectrum, pure materialism. And then 
we have in the middle the philosopher who, if the philosopher goes around religious people, they'll be like, hey man, you're not, you know, it's, like, it's like you don't believe in God, you know? And if, he, if the person goes to, to the science, uh, philosopher goes to the secular circle, scientific, let's say uh, in a scientific sense, and then the person is like, what do you mean, man? You're agnostic. How could you be agnostic? What else could there be, you know? So, so I'm telling you, it's this situation where the philosopher is the bridge between all observations upon uh, matter and the immaterial. And so I would say philosophy is, is, is a, uh, of course, the word philosophia comes from love of wisdom. Like that's what, what the, where the idea comes from. But uh, I would say more, it's like, um, it's pretty much, we, we, we created language and we can ask questions. And philosophers are asking questions with less limitations. That's it. And the mystic feels it, the mystic feels it's being the answer, and the scientist is endlessly inspired by the question. And the philosopher is like the, the mi mi dude in the middle. It's like, what do I do now? You know, it's like planting the seed and the person is wondering, when will my ability come? When will I have a fruit in my hand? And the way society is designed now, people expect to plant, they plant the seed and they think instantly there should be a solution. So many people are looking for instant solutions. And because of this urge to find an instant solution, there isn't a proper analysis or observation on the meaning of life. So stories uh, devour people like giant whales. You know, like, uh, and what I mean by that is that it's narrative and it's, it's, it's like, um, I was wondering, aside from the concept of God, what other idea do I have of what a collective being is? A collective being. You know, I mean, you can think of God, you can think of aliens, you can think of nature, the planet is a collective being. These are all ways of wondering of what a collective being could be. You could think of the whole cosmos as a being again, you know. Uh, but, there was one more. I don't know, I'm pretty much saying that they're all phenomenology in this plane of existence. If you are the attention piloting phenomena as the free will, that means if you don't think you have a free will right now, I have no idea how you're listening to my <laughs> No, no, the thing is that if we want let's say that there is linguistic oriented desires desires even stoic desires desires where the person doesn't desire actually a thing that the person is desiring to be in a certain behavior it's as if it's not just objects we desire about the future you know the person wants to also be something or do something or do, do you see so they want to it's also an experiential point of reaching it so the fact that we plant a seed it's as if I think the wisest thing is to plant the seed and let it surprise you later.
Somebody once asked me that, um, I mean, I, actually, it's not fitting to share here, but. I think it's that we are sold on a story that was the, our first prototype attempt at living. And I honestly feel like, um, I mean, it's strange. The caterpillar goes through metamorphosis. The snake, um, this, cre uh, this creature has to shed its skin or it dies. And nature has various levels that don't make sense. Like I remember when I was young, I looked at a yard and I, what I saw, like when I saw the insects, I was like, what the, f like what? <laughs> I was like, what are these, what are these red, like, it, it, there is a foreignness to the outer realms. That means the more I feel, as uh, more uh, my attention is drawn to thinking that I'm a material-oriented creature, um, the more empty I become. This is why, for example, in my, if there's been times where my, I mean, for a while, <clears throat> it's been years, but like since I've had a, you know, it's like when you understand how something works, then you don't usually have a problem with it, do you know? I think the best thing I can say is that it's like an Iron Man suit, language is an Iron Man suit we're in, and uh, we have forgotten that we are not the Iron Man suit. In one of my talks, I remember saying, it's like, imagine, you know, Tony Stark's wife being like, Tony, what the fuck, get out of the suit. <laughs> and Tony Stark is like, I'm no longer Tony, sweetie. Yesterday, I changed my legal name to Iron, first name and last name, man. And I'm just Iron Man. There's no longer a Tony Stark. I don't know who Tony is anymore, you know? And then Thor is dropping by and, I don't know, Thor's hammer suddenly wants to help the situation and Tony, Tony Stark breaks out of that Iron Man suit and realizes he was never just the way he looked at things. You are this attention that's moving between known and unknown variables. If you're smart, I feel you are attentive, you're alert. That's it. That's the only factor of intelligence I consider to be something that you can measure the intelligence of how much they're aware of what's going on in a room. That means imagine everybody was wearing sunglasses and everybody was like, how do we solve this mystery? Like, why are the stars dim? It makes no sense only for us to realize, oh my God, we, 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 we were wearing sunglasses and staring at the stars and wondering why it's dim, you know? <laughs> so... That's what I'm saying. That now that, that blindfold is language. I, I perceive it in that way. <laughs> so, Hunk. So guys, Honk in the chat section says an interesting comment. He says, the one thing we know is that, in quotations, I exist. Then he says, dot, 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 find, find the source of that I, in quotations, and nothing else. It's very simple and obvious. Everything else is complicated. Let's say you find that source. What then? What if you go towards that source and you see there is no personhood in that state? It's being energy. It's being energy. You know? After some point, energy doesn't, like, excuse my language, but energy doesn't give a shit about the concept. It's just a presence. The concept is for the individual, it's for, uh, for the archetypal being. If the ego could be compared to an egg, you know, they say uh, if an egg breaks from the inside, it breaks from the outside, there is no life. If it breaks from the inside, there is life. So this idea of you, if something from the outside changes your, the, the, your, your idea of you, then 
you haven't changed it. So technically, I think the best thing human beings can do, like the Buddha said, it's like we're all candles and these candles are melting and consciousness is the candle and this biological existence and manif objective manifestation is the wax of the candle. So what, what can a candle do? It can share its light. I think that light that we are to share is this massive question, this massive 8 billion people Q&A session. Do you know? You see, it's not just an emotional truth. An emotional truth is, um, and ex it, l let me tell you, there's only one way uh, uh, to be eternal, and that is you have always been. No one can become eternal. You know, it's like a statue, the sculptor making a statue, the statue coming alive and be like, why, why did you make me, man? And you're like, bro, I just, I don't know, I just, I just felt like, <laughs> it's like, you know, imagine, I'll create a story here. Imagine this guy suddenly found an audience with the voice of voices, God. The guy looks at God, God and says, God, why did you create all this? Oh my God, why? Why Why are we designed to suffer? Why is the world like this? Why is it that it's like you've made the world, but you're not, you haven't made it? And this ultimate question is being thrown at the source. It's not just the source is being questioned. That's like, that's it. that's doubt 1.0. <laughs> doubt 2.0 is when you're throwing the question at the source. And imagine the answer that comes from the beyond is because I felt like it. That means if we ascribe personality to the universe, that personality justifies irrational reasoning. Because the person is not a robot. You're not a 100% rational animal. For me, as, as far as I, I understand the mind and communication, it's, it's honestly like uh, you got to keep it alive. Just like how you eat food, your mind has to see something new throughout the day to, to be alive. You know? And I feel people's... People could be, uh, right now, there's so many people, you know, so many children of billionaires in the world, do you know? And if, it, like, here's the thing, it's like, knowing, The words evaporate before I can say it. I feel that materialism is the edge of immaterial enlightenment, and immaterialism is the edge of material enlightenment, and it's so geometrical. And all of knowledge is, in some sense, that something is occurring and through the bias of how you process it, you see the world. We are in one world, that is true. Right now I'm speaking, we're all on the same planet. Like it's phenomenal that we're on a rock. Like sometimes it's strange, I get this weird feeling sometimes that, uh, how do I say it, like right now we're on a giant rock and the planet appears flat. But sometimes I felt, what if it was a, like, what level? Like car-sized sphere I was standing on in the middle of empty space. There's this inner realm emotion that I often feel where it's, it's this solitude, but it's a solitude that no longer has a preference to interpret itself. 
So that solitude that doesn't have a preference to interpret itself is like has understood manifest reality as the second nature. So all living, physical, being in, uh, alive becomes strangely second nature. Because as far as I'm concerned, I'm an unknown phenomena, uh, temporarily known uh, in an unknown place. That's, that's the story of this rock we're on, ladies and gentlemen. That is the story of this great earth. It is in the middle of nowhere. And if you look at the word nowhere closely, put a little space between the W and the H, and you see we're now here. Nowhere and now here are the simultaneity of two views uh, of the polar mind. One, for, one from the top of the mountain to the bottom, one from the bottom to the top. Because it's very easy, very easy. This concept of, of the soul having image was what could be banished. That means somebody came and said, I'm a soul wrong. That sentence, how can a soul be a soul? How can nature? Or let me say it like this, could nature have divided and conquered itself towards a higher dimension? Only to realize, as Khalil Gibran was saying, the rivers lead to the ocean. All I know is we are energy, we are conscious, and all the meaning of our life is in language. I'm not joking. A lot of what life means to the human being is self-simulated. So I feel the healthiest way human beings on this rock, 8 billion, can progress is not for them to feel that they have, their, they have found truth. Anybody can assume victory. But for me, it's, 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 a, it's a symbiosis. I don't feel uh, I'm in, in just a vacuum. I feel this vacuum has evolved into a mind. Now the mind is becoming the ultimate vacuum. That means I was like, wait a minute. How could the speed of light be faster than the speed of my attention, which had to be quicker there before the light? So I think we're going to realize the quality of attention takes us towards the roots of energy. The quality of what's in the attention takes us and expands us into space. I think that's a good way of saying it. It's, ah, uh, uh, so, so yeah, I mean, Honk, I, I just read your comment, sure, you can have simulation theory. That's the ancient yogis called it a dream, now we're calling it a simulation holographic simulation like it's a it's a it's an archaic revival Terence McKenna talked about it simulation theory is an example of what Terence McKenna was saying the archaic revival life felt like a dream back in the day now it, it felt it feels real oh, everything's real man you know this coffee cup in my hands real you know and, and but then it's going towards the unreal and if we realize history is this wave of this rise and fall, the peaks and troughs are the known and the unknown, then you get comfortable. Then you realize this is the program. It's not designed for you to 24-7 at all times. No, we're not machines. And if we even in the future, uh, like Elon Musk is working on Neuralink and you know companies of this sort, uh, in Silicon Valley, they're trying to you know, of course, we have, we have this vision that by 2050, some huge technological revolution is going to happen. So at that point, in order for us to be able to keep up with that technological revolution, we have to start a way, we have to find a way. Like right now, the human being is not just trying to land on Mars, it's also trying to uh, become a file in a computer. We're trying to see if we can uh, make consciousness a file in a computer, you know. Like it's not just we want to go out beyond the skies, we want to also go beyond 
uh, I mean, technology is mind blowing. There's this, uh, there's this documentary. Oh my God, what was it called? It's called Silicon Valley. <laughs> That's the, the documentary. Guys, everybody who's here, go see that documentary. If you type it, it's going to come. Like, and now, go see the date where that documentary was posted, and now imagine what has happened. Back in the day, the purpose of life, it was very simple. It was very simple. Because the complex didn't exist yet. And that's the fascinating thing. And Terence McKenna was saying it in one of his talks, this crystallization towards complexity of from the Big Bang till now. That means it was like nothing, then something, then something becoming, oh my God, more of something. You know? So it's as if I'm like, what is this? It Could it be that there is a signal at the edge of the universe and this signal is causing everything to behave in a certain way? Like, I wouldn't be surprised if the center of the universe is like this giant speaker. <laughs> Somebody's playing like a track on it. We could all just be a DJ disc on a higher dimension, you know? <laughs> Anyways, guys, your ability is waiting for you because if you can see the world differently, you are literally seeing a different self which is has access to a different way of moving. So it's not about just uh, wanting to update yourself or improve yourself in this life, you have to also improve that world that that self is in. Which means you have to, look, the only way you can update the world, there's two ways. You go either build stuff in this life or you internally observe. And that's the thing. You know, for me, philosophy is also uh, noticing how far the concentration of man upon phenomena can go. For me, all the philosoph philosophers in history, they're all like kind of people who really zoomed in on something and they were like, yo, yo, what is this? What is this? What is this? And then it became like, for example, uh, as Hegel would say, like suddenly notice the internal object or Descartes noticed the isolated thinking subject. It's very fascinating. Language is like another body we're in. It's like we have a linguistic body which is the subject of existence. It's like, it's like there needs to be awareness to a landscape, to something. That awareness to something is binary, zero, one. Awareness is space. What's in the space, what's in your attention is, is the one which is a phenomenon. So ultimately, all personality is, can be divided into just being unknown being known to itself. That means the reason life can evolutionary-wise feel like a simulation because the subjective evolution is where the amnesia begins. That means it's not that man has forgotten, it's that being a, a subject limits you from caring to see the world move differently. So you should treat humanity as an explorer species. We're just here to see how far we can see. <laughs> what else can we do on a rock in the middle of nowhere? You know, seriously. Like, you know, for me, I can't, I don't even know if I can call it home. Usually the idea of home is somewhere where you know and you feel comfortable. When I, when I look at this universe, I'm like, am I being in, like, you know, a universe with like a billion trillion stars in it right now? Like, what the f <laughs> And that's the thing. We have bought into normality is a mask. And it's a comfortable mask to wear. But do you think Edison, who invented the light bulb, was a normal person? He, he, he saw the status quo, but he did something different.
That means he saw the status quo, but he was wise enough to also see who he was before the status quo. That perhaps there is a life you deserve that you have forgotten about. You know, Will Durant has this quote. He says, knowledge is the eye of desire and can become the pilot of the soul. That means, as you study wonder, <laughs> as Tolkien says, not all those who wander are lost. I feel it's a process. It's a process where at best 50% of it you can say you know. Because it's 50-50, you never, because we don't know the outcome, you know, every idea, there's a 50% chance that's the ultimate or 50% chance, no, it's like a coin flip, really. And the more we uncomprehend the human being as a process, as a creature, as a dynamic thing, we can't name. How could you, how could you just be, uh, um, like, you know what it is? It's, it's like one day waking up, writing on a piece of paper, who am I? And giving an answer to that, you know? <laughs> and then the next day waking up, writing another answer, writing another answer. And it's like, am I really all these answers? And you realize, no. You are... an unknown movement. And that's wisdom, to notice the unknown living presence of where we are. It doesn't mean it has to be ideological. It doesn't mean you, you have, you know, there, there has to be a, a, a face beyond, behind the clouds. It's just that when you come to look at your own face, even after you see it in the mirror, you can't not wonder who's looking through these eyes. And so that question is really where the intuitive thirst for knowing thyself begins. That was something that I realized no teacher. And even though I, I love my family, but no one in this life pointed this out to me. That I am the mover as primal as it may be so I, that's why I'm saying you gotta activate yourself as a pilot of your attention it's like when you and the best way this happens is when this is the, the biggest secret to I think um, anyways the mystery of ability let's say on this planet is to realize no one has your eyes. What does that mean? That means if you see a problem, no one else sees that. You see or you are seeing that problem in that way. It doesn't, do you know what I mean? I'll talk about the inner realms. Sorry guys, let me shout at this helicopter to keep it down. Keep it down, man! <laughs> it's like it's like meditate, send a telepathic message to the helicopter helicopter driver. I don't know if people can hear it, the helicopters passing outside. Or sorry, it's not a helicopter, so train. Yeah, it's the train. But there is helicopters sometimes. Sorry guys, I got, uh, my attention got distracted. Anyways, uh, the thing about ability is uh, you realize nobody has your eyes. You realize it's nobody else's responsibility, your eyes. Um, you realize you're mortal. You're temporarily here as a creature. You're like a candle. So whatever you see in this life 
if there is an efficiency or inefficiency, free will is the activation of it. So on some level, even the view on ability cannot be storified. Instead of thinking I'm this person or that person or that archetype or in, this, in the light of this archetype, instead the person can think, It's as if, what if freedom, what if eternity is experiencing temporalness? Or what if the temporal is experiencing the term? Because there is a codependence to it. What's interesting is we are free before we could not be. By the way, um, people are welcome to ask questions about this. Um, I could tell your ability is a journey. Oh my God, how could I have not spoken about this? Um, just like you run a business, there's a short-term and long-term kind of perspective you have, considering a long run, short run, or whatever. So so when you're looking at things in two different uh, times, time, uh, the, the short-term and the long-term, in the short-term, the, like the the ability required is, is just pretty much just go with the program, honor the program's uh, truth and see if the pro program honors its own truth. If the program doesn't honor its own truth, then leave the program. That means if we reach the point where our civilization uh, wasn't honest with its own inefficiency, then that is literally a sinking ship. I would suggest people to leave and go somewhere else and on this planet and start rebuilding the civilization. Sorry guys, there was this thing that I, I didn't finish saying, but the feeling is there. You know, like the feeling of what I wanted to say is there, but the words are not here. <laughs> Punk, I've spent countless nights, man, saying we are not creatures of language. You can try, and I, I will tell you, you're free. Try. Go and become some linguistic truth. Go and see if you can even be it. We are not perfect creatures. Therefore, to seek an ultimate perfection is not the full meaning of life. But if there is the opportunity to see something new, the effort is there. That means it's like, imagine you're someone and you come and see, let's say, poetically. Poetically, I'm saying. Uh, you imagine like 100,000 years in the future. Whatever. Let's say poetically. Okay? But then you come and see, you've seen the long term, now, what about the short term? And the short term can't be given. It would be on, on some level like... I don't know. I learned a lot from 
hearing Elon Musk speak on YouTube. And he said something very incredible. He said, um, if, if he said something like about questions and that uh, the hardest part is finding the right question to ask. And then the answer can be easier. And I think the way he means it is that when you find the right question, you find the right way to look at something. You are, you are not a creature of language, but when you communicate as an individual, a linguistic simulation appears the moment you move or you say it. It, evo it, evo it, it evokes. Sorry, guys. I'm, I'm just. I just saw Hawk's comment in the chat chat section, and I felt like responding. He says we are or aren't creatures of language. Experientially, you are. Existentially, how could you be? Experientially, even. There is this thing that they say, like in, in the whole mystical experience, pretty much what is like the algorithm, what is the pattern? The pattern is there is an observer and there is phenomena being observed. Now, right now, as I'm speaking to you, we are assuming we are the observed phenomena. Like I'm considering I'm this biological body, you're considering you're this biological body, everybody's considering they're this biological human being. I'm just trying to say we live through language if we want to share our inner realms. Language is the technology we use. If you're in a car, using a car, driving a vehicle on a highway, you know, it's like, are you the vehicle? Well, in that moment, you're the mind of the vehicle. When you drive a vehicle, you're the mind of that vehicle. That means I feel a good driver treats uh, the people, the people uh, in the car as the brain, and the car as the skull, and the great driver, whoever pilot, driver, and whatever you do, you know, in whatever way you navigate, the great driver considers that nothing, like you don't, you don't let anything hit your head. Construction workers wear helmets, you know? So that means you keep enough alertness to make sure that as if having a sensitivity to the edges of your car when you drive. The mind is so advanced, guys, that it is when you really wonder about visualization and its nature, when you really wonder about who is here, and is it just the who? And how could it just be a who if every year you're blowing a candle cake and you're becoming someone new? So the question is becoming complex, and that's the thing. Right now, society has brought its, its it has it made itself inefficient by locking itself into answers. The educational system should only allow the student to graduate and pass if they have asked a question no one on this planet has ever asked. And they contribute that question to the educational system. But the educational system is like, yeah, yeah, this is what people said back in the day. You don't have to think about it. The economical industry the sector is going to be totally different, you know. Just, just like, honestly, if educational systems just worked on the personality of people, it would be better for uh, the economical sector. Do you know? That means the educational system is, is, is a circus act. Because it has not understood that every person is, they harbor a world behind their eyes worth sharing.
So anyways, guys, I'm going to bring this talk to an end. Thanks for listening. Um, the most important thing about ability is that really you're able and uh, you have access to what's in your attention. Attention is your most valuable resource. And Mr. Within is saying many people, they go to the gym, they practice their physical realms, their objective realms. It's all, if you wanted to do go to the gym for your inner realms, that would be you finding moments in life where you wonder about what it means and caring to see how your eyes can climb the mountain. Because that separates the scholar from someone who is wearing knowledge. Someone who cares about the question. That means if somebody says a question and people laugh and a few people don't, the, those people who don't laugh are the scholars. Because all of life is really at, at its core caring for what's happening. What greater guide for the spirit could there be? Anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. I'm going to have a five-minute Q&A in case people have questions. If not, thanks for listening. Blessings. And uh, so people can ask the, their questions in the chat section, and uh, I'll enter cyberspace to answer. Okay, so, um, Honk, I, I, I'm trying to comprehend your question. <laughs> so you say, if you were out in public social distancing with your friends and you had to get home to have a live webcast, would you say, I gotta get home to teach a class, gotta run? Teach a class? 
Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I don't think I don't think of this as a class. I don't I, I don't think of people as students. I I see people in two ways, either as advanced communicators or pilots. Because the being is unknown. That means it's like if you want to respect human beings, other human beings, you have to realize that there is an unknown component. No, 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 it's, it's an interesting question. You're making me think, uh, if you want me to give you a funny answer, like, let me see, if, like, play, playfully what I would say, I'd probably say, um, uh, I'd be like, I gotta go, guys, the inner realms need me. <laughs> Kind of like Batman exit, you know, which is just running away at a fast speed, you know. You know, <laughs> I know, I know, but you know, <laughs> interesting question, interesting question. Uh, you know, I don't know. Ability is something where life is happening, really. Sometimes I'm like, you can't even ask the question of what life means because it hasn't finished. It's like the film is still running. And that's the cool thing. That I, I was like, what is this? That every day I go in my bed and sleep and I'm so comfortable to suddenly stop existing to myself. And then my whole life I go fearing death, which I think is non-existence. And this was mind-boggling. That how is it I sleep so easily? And then I realized because nature doesn't, it's, it's, it's like nature is not conceptual. So just like how the person may not know how the heart is working exactly, but uh, knows they have a heart that's working. guys thanks for tuning in and uh, honestly you gotta attempt the new if you are if you care for what ability means there's no such thing I think as talent there's just micro zooming and trusting the moment and going on and seeing how far you can move something you got to test your own strength you know And most people, it's easy for them to dishonor their mind. This is why uh, when I see people who they speak of themselves in a lesser light, just speak, they reduce themselves vocally in front of the other person. You know, they self-depreciate themselves thinking it's like some weird, uh, you know, uh, ethical humility, but it's not. Let me tell you, it's... Uh, your communication shows the world you're looking at. That means I knew this when I began giving these talks. I knew that there's nothing to hide. So, the inner realms is, uh, I don't know, I think nature doesn't have a, too much of a conceptual relationship with itself at its core. Like the heart just naturally beats, the, the person naturally breathes, and the person of course based on how much they care to really look through these eyes that they have. Uh, and these eyes can even be seen as a revolving door. That's a good way of seeing the eyes, you know. The eyes of the mind is a revolving door between all that is unknown and all that can be known.
Thanks for tuning in, guys. Blessings.